All right, look, maybe then um, we pass to, to the mass. And I wanted to spend maybe like 20 minutes or half an hour just to talk and to, to explain what this course will be about. So uh, perhaps some things will not be precise during these first 20 minutes, half an hour. Perhaps some things uh, will not be completely understandable, but I think it's, it's okay, right? It just uh, uh, to get a feeling what it is about. So this will be uh, perhaps, let me call it paragraph zero introduction. And uh, mm, I wanted to tell you that, um, so my experience is the best if uh, I don't create the PDF file in advance, but I, I write in front of you as if it were teaching on, on the board. So uh, that's a bit slower, but then it's a better pace. So tell me if you don't like it. So um, the main topic of uh, study in this course, these are so-called Hamiltonian G spaces. And I have a color code, so um, I write in black some things and in blue other things. And by the way, those files we're also going to put on, on the website, so you, you will have access to those files. And also in the end of the class, I can probably know, but maybe that, that takes too much time. So we're, we're going to put those, those files that I create on the website. So basically, there is one definition, which is rather complex and uh, which is very, very successful. And it has many surprising consequences. So let me maybe uh, develop a little bit and say what this definition is about. So there are several, several parts of it. First of all, uh, we'll say that M will be an often compact, but sometimes not compact manifold. And the dimension will typically be even, but again, not always. And um, this manifold will be equipped with a differential two form. So omega two will stand for differential two forms, in general omega k for differential k forms. So it will be closed uh, under the Durham differential. And uh, if you write omega in some local chart, right? So this will be some functions, omega ij dx of, of x times exterior product of dxi dxj, then we require that the determinant of that matrix omega ij be non-zero and actually it's independent, uh, this condition is independent on the choice of coordinates. So um, such a pair M omega is called the symplectic manifold. And so we'll be interested in symplectic manifolds. Uh, maybe now I should say something, right? So there is, uh, there is a whole big field of mass, a big field of geometry, which studies symplectic manifolds. The mainstream part of it is called symplectic topology. And that's a very deep, very interesting field, very analytical, very complicated. And we absolutely don't go in that direction. Instead, we go in the direction of uh, combining symplectic geometry with group actions. And in some minutes, I explain why, why this is my choice. So uh, let's say another actor will be G, a Lie group. If you don't know what those Lie groups are, it's not very important. But an important example that we're gonna consider will be uh, real Tori. And these are simply products of circles. So, so these are K copies of a circle. And then um, associated to this Lie group, there is a Lie algebra of G. Again, I, I don't quite know your, 
your background may be for many for many of you perhaps that's a very very standard very easy thing but maybe some of you don't know that so in this case in particular if uh, if you're looking at a torus then uh, the corresponding Lie algebra is simply isomorphic to the vector space r to the power k um, and uh, we'll be looking at the situation when the group is acting on a manifold. So that is, there is a map from G cross M to M with uh, certain properties. So the action, right. Uh, and we'll be assuming that omega, the two form, the symplectic form that we were talking about is actually invariant under this action, right? So uh, we have almost done the preparations to state the definition. So as I say, in this course, of course, there will be many things, many definitions, but maybe there is one main driving definition. And this definition is of a Hamiltonian G space. So, um, we're going to have the following data. So uh, group acts on M, omega is a symplectic two form, which is invariant under the G action. And on top of it, there is a map from M to the dual of the Lie algebra. So very complicated, right? <clears throat> many, many, many things. So, is in Hamiltonian G space, G space. If there are the following conditions which are satisfied, so there are, depends how you count, I count three conditions. So M omega is symplectic in the sense that we briefly defined before. So the second condition here, I, I got on a sheet. I will pretend that G is a torus because otherwise it would be too long to explain. And in any event, we're gonna look at it later on in, in a lot more detail. So this condition is saying that mu, uh, is invariant under the action. So you move uh, a point M on M by a group element G and uh, this map mu doesn't change. So, and finally the third condition which perhaps is the most strange and the most cryptic of all. So um, you choose some element in the Lie algebra and you associate to that element using the action, a vector field on M. So that's the uh, notation for vector fields. That's also called the fundamental vector field. We're gonna discuss it in more detail. So a fundamental vector field on M. And then what you do, you substitute this vector field in the two form. So the result is a one form, right? We had two D axis. Now you kill one of the D axis by a substitution and you get a one form. And this one form is exact and obtained uh, by taking a differential of the pairing of mu with X. So recall that mu takes values in, um, in the dual space G star and X is an element of G. So they're in duality and out of a vector valued function mu, you can now construct just the real value to just a function with values in real numbers. So that's this uh, um, pairing of mu with X. And that's, uh, that's uh, you, you get a function, you take is Durham differential. So, um, that's uh, that's the definition. Incidentally, this mu is called 
uh, moment map or sometimes in the literature momentum map it's interesting that there are two big schools in the US which uh, developed very much this theory and there is an east coast school where it's always called a moment map and there is a west coast school where it's called momentum map but so in the literature you can see both things so you know now you may be wondering do you really want to 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 continue with this course right so the guy said it's the main definition it looks as a sort of very very special somewhat strange definition why is it of uh, why is it of any interest so i'll try to justify it but let just let me first tell you my personal story why i'm teaching a course about it and how i uh, came to I, I got to to study this field that's because at some point uh, i got to a conference in this field and so i must say the the results they they were talking about they were reports and they were so beautiful so magical so like unbelievably interesting so that i decided i absolutely want to study it i don't know of course whether i will be successful in convincing you to study it maybe not but uh, uh so you see this definition is uh, kind of uh, complicated but it has many absolutely beautiful and unbelievable consequences uh, i will now try to cite uh, three theorems three big theorems that we're going to later see in the course in more detail and in fact there is the fourth theorem that we may or may not encounter and i would say in a beauty they probably uh, compared to the something like a residue theorem, right? The residue theorem in uh, complex analysis, that's something where, okay, you, you learn in your first year calculus that there are those integrals. Usually you cannot compute them. Sometimes you can compute them with great effort. And all of a sudden they tell you, oh, there is this whole bunch of integrals that you compute basically for free using the residue theorem. So it's a little bit, you can, you can think it's a little bit like, like that here. Okay, so what are, the, uh, what are the corollaries of this theorem, of this definition? So um, one big result that we're going to see in the course, that's, let's call it for now, for the introduction, for the purposes of introduction, we call it theorem one. And uh, it is the convexity result. And it says the following. Suppose we take an image of M inside this space G star. Let's recall that for now to simplify things, we assume that uh, G is a torus. So then the Lie algebra of the torus, I told you that's uh, the, the space R to the power K. And its dual is, of course, also isomorphic to R to the power K. So mu of M is some subset of R to the power K. And it turns out that um, this subset is a convex polytop. So this is an intersection of uh, some finite number of uh, half spaces. And there are some, some further conditions, but uh, to imagine what uh, possible outcomes can be, let's say in dimension two, we'll be getting whatever, some rectangles or triangles or things like that and so on. So that's, um, that's always what you get. And uh, that's deep, surprising relates this field to combinatorics, relates this field to so-called toric geometry. We're gonna see some glimpse of it in the course, but uh, above all, I mean, of course, nothing in the definition, right? Predicts that there would be so well structured, so combinatorially looking results. And it still surprises me, I must say. So, um, so that's uh, the result number one. 
The result number two that we're gonna see in the course, it goes under the name of reduction. And uh, reduction says the following. Here we would need a little bit more structure, but actually in the course we might see it before convexity, we, 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 we'll see. So suppose I choose some point uh, in the image of mu. So we said the image of mu is that convex polytope. So I take a point of that convex polytope and let me introduce a further assumption. Of course, we're going to discuss later on how feasible this assumption is. Uh, so, um, so our group by the invariance of mu, the group acts on the fiber, on the pre-image of xi. And uh, we assume that this action is free. Of course, this may not be true. Perhaps it never happens. So we would need to figure out how generic this condition is. So then uh, it turns out that the space M denoted M xi. So this is um, a quotient of the level set by the G action. Is a smooth manifold. So it's a kind of nice space on which we can do calculus. And it is symplectic. So um, uh, I won't give you the construction of the symplectic form, even though it doesn't take that much time, but we're going to see already some first glimpses of it. Uh, later during the this lecture in some simplified situation, uh, you know it doesn't like sound much, but uh, this is a very very popular construction and very popular theorem. And why is that? That because you know constructing symplectic manifolds, right? So here we said the symplectic manifold. You need this two form, which would be closed and non-degenerate. It's not that easy. Sometimes there are natural constructions, but I mean, uh, uh, this reduction is probably one of the main sources of uh, symplectic manifolds because you can start with an easy one with group action. An easy one, I mean, maybe just a vector space. In many cases, it's just a vector space on which you have uh, a linear group action. And then out of it, uh, if, the axioms of a Hamiltonian G space are verified. This reduction construction produces for you tons and tons of new examples. Because for each uh, psi which is eligible, you produce a new symplectic manifold, which potentially has some interesting and possibly complicated topology, some kind of non trivial symplectic structure. So, so this is basically mine from which you can dig many, many interesting examples. So uh, finally, let me cite one more result. Serum stream going under the name of localization. Yeah, I actually never know, right? It, we, we used to, to spell this word with Z, but now I don't know my usually it's spelled with S. I, I don't quite know. That's probably the difference between American and British English. I don't quite know what's right, what's wrong. Maybe Ian can correct me on that. And uh, now we consider the following. We consider a function, pi of x. Yeah, Ian, don't, don't, don't hesitate. Okay. Tell me. When it's I just I... say that I always used to think I could be sure as well, but recently I've realized it's also confusing even for English. It doesn't matter, it's not the right moment to discuss it. But it's, uh... No, but I but, know, uh, but, but whatever. Yeah. When, whenever whenever I, I do some, some silly thing, no, don't. Right, don't. It's okay. So we consider a function i of x, uh, which depends uh, on a point, uh, on, on an element of the Lie algebra. And so um, this function is an integral over M uh, of uh, the exponential 
of the pairing of mu with x. So recall again, right? Mu takes values in G star, x is an element of G. So mu of m pairing with x, we already used that function once, right? In the definition of Hamiltonian G spaces. So it's just a function in our manifold. We can take uh, an exponential of it. In fact, often for now, we were always working over reals, but um, you can actually even complexify the situation. So you can extend your base field to C and take X to be an element uh, of GC, then this will be a complex valued function in the exponent. Um, Excuse me, and, it's an integral over some measure on M? Yeah, 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 I, I haven't, yeah, sorry, I haven't finished, yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course you're right. So, and for the measure, we, we take this top degree form, omega was a two form, now omega to the power N is an element of uh, uh, omega to N of M, and uh, by convention to N was the dimension of the manifold. In fact, it turns out that uh, this, uh, this form is non-vanishing. So, which means that it, it, uh, it gives an orientation um, to M and then uh, omega to the power N of N factorial defines the measure. We're gonna discuss it um, in more detail. It's called the Liouville measure. Um, measure on M, and so now this is um, this is a this is an integral. If the manifold is compact, it's a very well defined integral. Sometimes you can negotiate non-compact situations as well, and um, so it turns out that uh, such an integral can be computed in the following way. Uh, so let's consider uh, M G the uh, space of G fixed points. So these are fixed points of, uh, of the G action. Anton, does, is M required to be compact? Did you say? I don't know. Uh, let's say is it it's, required? Easiest, it's easiest to require that M is compact, mm -hmm. but sometimes you can negotiate non-compact situations, but then you, you need to explain how this integral, in what, in what sense the integral exists, does it converge? But if M is compact, then we are guaranteed that everything is fine. So that's, uh, I think for now, let's, uh, let's settle for that. So this MG, the set of fixed points, it also turns out to be a manifold. That's kind of what one needs to discuss. Uh, but this doesn't need to be connected. So it, in principle, it may be disconnected and have many connected components. Let's say capital F is such a connected component. And then uh, here there would be integrals over those connected components of uh, something. Let me let me denote this something by alpha f. Uh, I, I'm not gonna make precise now what they are, but actually even stated like that, this is a very, very powerful statement of that localization theorem. For instance, uh, maybe just one remark. Uh, just one remark. Uh, so, um, if this fixed point set is empty, then on the right hand side, the sum is empty, right? And uh, this would mean that the integral has to vanish, right? So i of x is zero. Um, another interesting situation suppose that mg. is a finite set, right? So then, uh, of course, there are no integrals anymore, right? So then the, the right-hand side is simply a sum 
over those f's. So now these are just points. And here there will be those alpha f, whatever they are. So they are numbers associ assigned to those points. You know, now this uh, starts resembling like maybe, let, let, let me say, compared to, to the residue, to the Cauchy residue theorem, right? There also, you, you have an integral and then it's replaced by the sum of uh, numbers associated to some special points inside your integration domain. So th this is some kind of uh, cousin of the residue theorem. One should also say that uh, maybe about this localization uh, that there is uh, the whole field of study which is related to it, which is which goes under the name of uh, of equivalent homology, which is also part of this course. So I would say maybe just as a first approximation, of course, there will be other things coming up, but as a first approximation, we can take it as a guide to the course. So we have that one definition and three theorems. Of course, yeah, as I, as I say, there will be other things, but maybe that's a good point where we can stop this introductory part. As you see, they kind of, uh, those results are surprising beautiful in some way uh, they are not too hard of course we'll have to work through the course but uh, they they don't involve very difficult analysis so they are more like imaginative results unexpected beautiful after all again if you use this analogy with the residue theorem residue theorem is not that hard right it's it kind of the proof comes more or less for free but it's very powerful I think the same applies to, uh, to this story. So, <clears throat> all right, I would like to uh, finish the introduction here. And um, I don't know whether you have some questions or remarks at this point. And what about the, the first theorem? Sorry? Say again. Uh, uh, you mentioned the force theorem. Uh, am I right? Oh, the force theorem. Yes, the force theorem. Let me let me just um, just say the name. Yeah, right. But I, I, you see, I'm not completely sure that I um, uh, I'm gonna cover it or we're gonna have glimpses of it in the course. So the the force theorem. Uh, well, it goes under this uh, cryptic name. So uh, let me let me spell it. So it's called quantization commutes with reduction. Sometimes it's also called the gilman sternberg principle. So quantization commutes with reduction. So reduction we've already seen. But then one needs to add one more construction called quantization. In this case, this is the so-called geometric quantization. And uh, so this theorem states that you can either do quantization on the on a Hamiltonian G space and then do reduct some kind of quantum reduction, whatever that means, or you do the reduction procedure that I described in theorem two, of course, very cryptically and very briefly, and then do uh, the geometric quantization, whatever that means, and this produces the same outcome. So, uh, um, as I say, maybe we have time to, to, to talk about it or maybe not. In principle, that's also some very, very uh, influential principle which is used in many uh, mathematical fields, especially those connected to, to physics, to quantum physics. And um, of course, uh, they, people say principle because sometimes it's a theorem, sometimes it's a wish, sometimes uh, maybe it's even not true. But, uh, but in, in simple situations, similar to those that I described before, uh, this, is, uh, this is a very powerful theorem this Q, Q commutation of Q is R is zero. All right. 
Uh, any other questions at this um, at this point? Uh, maybe one uh, one one more thing. Uh, yeah. After after reduction, we can get a non-Hamiltonian but symplectic, but symplectic space. Yes, it can be like without moment map. Oh, after reduction, you see, then it depends. Normally, we kill the group action, right? The uh, the outcome of the reduction is a symplectic space, or maybe symplectic manifold, symplectic orbifold, symplectic something. But if we if we do the reduction under the full group action, then uh, the, uh, the there is no group action remaining. But uh, you're right. Maybe uh, the group in the beginning was bigger, right? That that might be. So, for instance, just to simplify things, a product of two groups which commute H and G, and then I divide by the G action, then the H action remains. So that, that's also often exploited. There is even the whole industry called reduction in stages. You first do reduction on the G, then you may continue with reduction under the action of H. So in principle, you can get uh, you can stay in the same category. You can get Hamiltonian uh, G spaces uh, as uh, as an outcome. I must say that for me, it's difficult to to see the chart. So here, there were questions: uh, What is F and alpha F in theorem three? But then there were there, 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 there were also answers on the uh, on the chart as well. So you see, for, I, I, I don't know, at least on this machine, I don't see the chart very well. So don't hesitate to unmute yourself and ask questions. I, I'll try, of course, to follow the chart, but maybe whatever, Ian, if you also see something interesting going on on the chart and I don't say anything, then- so The person was asking for more clarification of what is F and alpha F, but- Yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah. by now I- but so I think it's, it's given that you didn't say very much, so- Yeah, yeah. but I think by now it was uh, it was also answered on, on, on the chart. Oh, so the answer was given that it's strictly not specified. So, mm -hmm. yeah. although F connected components is a bit so, yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, that was a kind of introductory and motivating part, why we're gonna see interesting things. And well, you know, like uh, for the remaining time of, of today's lecture, maybe we should uh, dive and do some kind of uh, more standard work. And you see, uh, especially why I wanted to motivate you today, because like the, uh, the material that uh, from which we should start, it's called uh, symplectic linear algebra. And you know, linear algebra, it's of course a very important part of our education. It's not always uh, most fun part, but we'll, we'll see, you, you'll tell me whether you like it or not. So now more regular discussion starts. Again, still, I probably won't be proving everything. And uh, sometimes maybe uh, I'm a bit sloppy then, you uh, you you're invited to kind of catch me. That's that's fine. Mm -hmm. So we start with v a vector space. Uh, it will usually be over R. Sometimes it might be also over C. Um, and we we assume. Also, usually we assume that dimension of V is finite, but of course, especially in, in, in the exercises, sometimes there will be also infinite dimensional examples to make it more fun. So now we are looking at uh, omegas, which are bilinear maps or bilinear forms from V cross V to R. And we assume that they are skew symmetric. So omega of UV is minus omega of VU. And uh, it is convenient to introduce the notion of a kernel of omega. So they are all those V and V such that, sorry, 
such that omega of uv is zero for all u and v. So um, maybe one more notation. If we choose a basis in our vector space, So then we can construct a matrix, an n by n, or whatever dimension. I don't know what is this dimension. It used to be two n, right? Let's say, kind of for the future use. For now, of course, it can be any dimension, but later on it will be even. So, um, so we can construct a matrix just by putting in uh, the basis vectors into omega. And since uh, omega is skew, it is minus omega gi. So um, the pair, this vector, this vector space with such a skew symmetric bilinear form. So the omega is also called symplectic. Right, we already had briefly this type of um, notion. If uh, the uh, um, the matrix omega ij is non-degenerate, or as you probably know from elementary linear algebra right so that's equivalent to to the kernel of omega being zero right so that's um, that's the same now um let me give you a proposition and in fact um i i won't prove it but there will be uh, in, on the problem set that I shared with you, problem number one, it basically solves that, um, uh, um, gives a proof of this proposition. So one can choose a basis. So let's call it pi. Pi from, goes from one to two n. such that um, the only non-vanishing elements of our matrix will be omega 2k minus one to k and is equal to one. And of course is equal to minus omega 2k, 2k minus one. So these are the only non-vanishing entries. In other words, Omega has the following shape, right? So here it is zero, one, minus one, zero, zero, one, minus one, zero, and so on. So it continues with such two by two blocks, and these are zeros elsewhere. So, but by the way, uh, maybe I would at this point it would be good to have your feedback. H how is it for all of you? This is obvious, or let's say you're not surprised. Maybe you don't know how to prove it, or I mean, how, how or, or it's completely surprising. H how is it? Just I think it was it was on geometry one. On <laughs> yeah, course. right. So it, this this is some something kind of standard. Okay, perfect. Right, so then this is, of course, in the course, there will be such reminders, so that's hopefully okay, just to, to set our notations. In fact, uh, the, I, want to, um, I want to say that the, the, I, I can rephrase the same statement in a slightly different form, which will be sometimes more convenient for us. So, um, so there is a basis, which I now denote slightly differently. There will be two different letters. So N basis elements, which are called X, 
and n basis elements which are called y so and um, omega of xi xj will be the same as omega yi yj and will be zero for all ij and omega of xi yj will be the Kronecker delta delta ij so um, now this, uh, uh, if I, uh, on the basis, I write first axis and then y's, as I did here, right? So then uh, my omega will now be uh, um, the, the matrix with four blocks. So here will be the unit matrix. Here will be minus the unit matrix and here there will be a zero. In fact, the two statements are, of course, equivalent. I'm just uh, reordered the basis in some way, right? So you can easily figure out how, how I reordered it. I think my axes are E1, E3, E5, probably these are E's, these odd, uh, these odd labels, and Y's are E's with even labels, right? Then you reorder the basis and you get this, uh, this kind of, um, this kind of expression, right? Okay, so um, a little bit more stuff, probably also quite standard. Um, so let me introduce the dual basis in the dual space. Let me call them Fi. So that's the dual basis to those E's, right? And this is sitting inside the dual space V star. Uh, so then um, actually I can also think of omega as an element of uh, second exterior power of the space V star, right? So if you were thinking of linear forms, then this uh, would have been elements of V star. Now we are thinking of uh, skew symmetric bilinear forms these are elements of the second exterior power of uh, V star. Is it also everybody is comfortable with that? If not, please complain. Uh, and I just want to say that um, this, uh, this prescription here, this one, I can rewrite it as a formula for, uh, for omega. So, and this formula is omega is F1 veg F2 plus F3 veg F4 plus so on plus F to N minus one veg F to N. So maybe I do just uh, one very, very small uh, calculation just, just in, in case that some people are uncomfortable with it. So if I compute omega of E1, E2, right? So then only the first term will contribute because F3, F4, and so on, anyways, they vanish on those E's. So this is F1, F2 computed on E1, E2. And this is equal to F1 of E1 times F2 of E2. And this is equal to to one, so so that's that that just just shows the relation between the two formulas, um, and here maybe uh, uh, maybe a remark which also connects us a little bit to the introduction. So let me compute the following element, right? So I have now an element of exterior algebra of degree two, this omega, and I compute omega to the power n divided by n factorial. This n factorial you will see, of course, that just a normalization factor for historical purposes, you can say, but the answer is more beautiful if you, if you write it, uh, if you divide by n factorial. So this is one over n factorial and here f1 veg f2 plus blah, 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 plus f2 n minus one veg f2 n to the power n. So note that in the sum here, there are exactly n 
terms. And um, right, we want to compute, we want to compute the, the, the answer in the exterior algebra. So uh, let me give you, let me tell you what the answer is, and then uh, maybe you, you give me feedback whether for you it's obvious or not. First of all, you know, of course, uh, when you take the nth, uh, nth power of the sum of n terms, there will be many terms. But in particular, uh, uh, you know, we are not allowed to repeat one term many times because f1 square in the exterior algebra is zero and fi square for any i is zero, right? So we are only allowed to take from different copies from, uh, like we can say we have a product of n uh, copies of that bracket, we are only allowed to take each term once. So this already tells us that there are n factorial combinations. Hopefully they all give the same result and anticipating it, I multiply by n factorial. And what is one of those terms? You know, differential forms may be a tricky thing because there are signs, but these are two forms. Two forms are even, and for this reason, all the signs are always plus one, whatever you do. If you reorder those terms, you always only get plus signs. Then it's not so bad because we just need to take a product of all those terms. F4, veg, so on, F to N minus one, veg, F to N. So uh, in particular, the factorials cancel and we just get a product of uh, basic, basic linear forms, which is a volume form on V. So, um, so this result is non-zero. And this is, um, this is a top degree. Non-vanishing. Multilinear form on V. And um, sometimes one abbreviates it as a, by saying it's a volume form. So this is, um, this is an element in veg to n, veg to n V star. So are you comfortable with this reasoning? Okay. So um, now, kind of uh, one more concept that I would like to introduce today. Um, so, um, right. One more concept. So, you know, we have this, uh, we decided we have uh, the omega asymplectic back to space. Uh, and um, well, omega, we can interpret as a matrix in some basis, or we can interpret as an element of uh, veg2 v star. Now I want to make out of it one more construction. So so-called uh, omega flat or omega musical, musical map produced from omega. And this will be a map mapping v to v star. That's uh, the symplectic cousin of what you can do with a metric. You know, when you have say Euclidean uh, vector space or Hermitian vector space, then you typically have an isomorphism between, uh, between the vector space and its dual. It's similar for the symplectic story and uh, you know how it works. So um, if you take some element, some vector V, it is mapped um, to a form, to a linear form, uh, omega flat of V and omega flat of V, you can compute it, right? It's a linear form. So that's an element of V star. 
You can compute it on some other vector v, u, sorry, which is in v. And of course, the only, the only construction that you have, you can substitute both vectors into a mega. So it's a little bit like tautological, what we're saying now. Now we assume that omega is what is called non-degenerate. The kernel of omega is zero. And uh, because of that, right, maybe I write in some different color. So kernel of omega is zero. And because of that, this musical map is an isomorphism. So actually, uh, this is an isomorphism from V to V star, which if you want, you can identify them, but, uh, but this map is an isomorphism of those vector spaces of the same dimension. Okay, very good. So now let me, uh, let me introduce yet another, let me use this construction to the following effect. Um, so suppose uh, we have a vector subspace U inside V. So it's subspace. So now uh, let me associate to it another subspace. I call it U omega. And uh, these are these are the vectors in V such that you can now guess omega of VU is zero for all U in U. So I think sometimes it is called omega orthogonal. Omega orthogonal of U. Right. Okay. Um, a simple proposition. So that's linear algebra, right? So we should be saying something about dimensions. So the dimension of U plus the dimension of omega orthogonal of U is the dimension of V, which I remind you is equal to some number to N. Uh, how is it? Is, is it? is it obvious? I will give you a brief proof, but by in principle, this is some kind of uh, basically, uh, basically linear algebra, right? So um, first of all, uh, let me consider an image of you under this musical map, right? So this is a subspace of, uh, of the dual space, right? And since uh, omega flat is an isomorphism, so the dimension of this space is of course equal to the dimension of you. That's because omega flat is an isomorphism, right? Now, if you, um, if you think about it, what is this uh, u omega, omega orthogonal? In fact, this is uh, the uh, orthogonal of that space. What, 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 what do I have in mind here, right? These are all the vectors in V such that omega flat of U V is zero for all U in U, right? So th this, is, this is more or less a tautology. But now uh, suppose you are given a subspace of the dual space. So what of some dimension? So what's the dimension of the common of the of the common kernel of all those linear forms? Of course, that, that's by standard linear algebra. We know that it is complementary to the dimension 
of the of, of the space of linear forms that you are talking about so the uh, whatever the uh, standard linear algebra is telling you that the uh, dimension of this omega flat of u plus dimension omega flat of u orthogonal so this is the dimension of v right but now uh, but now this guy is just dimension of u um, orthogonal and this guy is just the dimension of u so that's um, uh, that's how we wanted it um, so now maybe one more proposition sorry that it dives a little bit into this uh, boring stuff but i think we will be through with the linear algebra stuff today so uh, in a week from now we will be doing something which is a little bit more fun so another proposition which says that if you take the orthogonal of the orthogonal then you get back to you well so maybe again let me indicate A short proof. Um, so, what is this uh, orthogonal of the orthogonal, right? So, these are vectors in V such that omega u v is zero for all uh, for all u in u orthogonal. Uh, but notice that, uh, of course, the vectors of uh, u, so if v were in u, then certainly this, this would be true, right? Because that's, that's, that's just the definition of, uh, 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 of u, u omega. So actually, u itself is, of course, sitting inside, right? That's a little bit how in linear algebra for finite dimensional case, you're showing that uh, v star star is isomorphic to V. Now, how do we see it? Well, uh, we know that dimension of U plus dimension of U omega orthogonal is equal to dimension of V. But then we also know that this is a dimension of uh, U omega orthogonal plus the dimension of U omega orthogonal orthogonal, right? That's we're just using twice the previous proposition. Well, uh, then it turns out, right, that we can cancel and the dimensions of u and dimension of u omega omega, they are the same, right? So these are two spaces of the same dimension and u is a subspace of u omega omega. Well, then uh, there is not much else but to say that u is equal to u omega omega okay so sorry for this um, a little bit boring stuff now maybe something which is uh, slightly more interesting uh, maybe you've heard about it before or maybe not and um, you know in the symplectic vector spaces there are subspaces of different type. So uh, I won't give you a complete classification, but I'll give you some of the types that we're gonna need in our discussions. So um, what may happen, right? So for instance, it may happen that U is contained in U omega orthogonal. So in this case, such a subspace, is called isotropic. And uh, notice that uh, this, uh, this equality, right? So dimension U plus dimension U omega orthogonal, that's dimension V, which is equal to 2N. And now this is greater or equal than twice dimension of U, right? Because 
u omega orthogonal contains u, and then its dimension is at least the dimension of u. And we, we get a, a nice, simple, but nice result that dimension of isotropic subspaces is greater or equal to n. And maybe let me give you an example. Suppose that in terms of a symplectic basis, I take the subspace spent by the first K uh, basis vectors X. So, and I invited to check that this is indeed an isotropic subspace. And as promised, its dimension cannot exceed N, right? I have at most, uh, at most N vectors which would, uh, which would still have a label X. Maybe another, another, another good remark. So suppose I have u and v in u, then it is obvious that omega of u v is zero, right? That's because if u is contained in uh, u orthogonal, then we can say we can give it an interpretation that u is in u and v is in u which is contained in u orthogonal and therefore omega has to vanish on this pair so uh, that's the that's the first type which i uh, which is useful then um, there is a subtype um, i don't think we're going to need it well, maybe we, we're going to need it a little bit so if u is equal to u omega, then such a subspace is called Lagrangian. And this is a very, very important case for symplectic topology. That's probably the most, the most important case. And uh, you can already guess, right? In this case, the formula, the dimension formula, it simply implies that the dimension of u is equal to half of the dimension, right? So here, there is really no choice. Um, an example would be R of x on x1, xn. Another example would be R of y1, yn. And it is still true that omega of uv is zero for all u and v and u. And this is because Lagrangian implies isotropic, right? So isotropic was a, uh, was a weaker condition. So there, there we were saying that u is contained in u omega orthogonal, but now it's equal. So it's a stronger condition, but all, all the conclusions, they still hold. Um, so there are two more cases that I want to, to present. So one of them is u contains u omega. And this is called co-isotropic. Right, in this case, it's an easy computation, which tells you that, uh, sorry, that dimension of U is greater or equal to N. So that, that's a similar, similar dimension argument. And uh, of, course, uh, of course, if U is uh, isotropic, so maybe a remark, So if U is isotropic, so this is equivalent, this is equivalent to U omega being co-isotropic. So that's maybe, I don't prove it, but um, but it's an easy it's an easy exercise. And maybe the last type of subspaces that we are interested in, 
and we, we're going to use it from time to time. Suppose that U intersection with U omega is trivial. This may also happen. So then you see what happens. So these are two subspaces with uh, trivial intersection and with complementary dimensions, right? So then the dimension formula implies that actually V is a direct sum of U and U omega and such subspaces they're called symplectic and um, there is the following fact that is also easy to easy to uh, um, to prove so if one takes such a symplectic subspace and one takes a, a bilinear form u omega and restricts it on u so this is a symplectic vector space. Right. So we still have maybe two, three minutes. And I would like to finish this class with the following proposition. So, so let the omega be symplectic vector space and u in v An isotropic subspace. So then um, the quotient space u omega mod u is symplectic. With symplectic. Form. And let me denote the symplectic form by omega prime. And well, this symplectic form, right, is uh, on the elements of the quotient space. So the elements of the quotient space are like that A plus U and B plus U, right, where A and B are in U omega. And I simply define it as. Omega of um, omega of a b. Um, in principle, the proof of this statement is quite short. Maybe it would even fit into the remaining one and a half minute. But uh, but that's that's uh, in some way this is an important statement because remember we had that reduction theorem today, right? And this is a baby version of the reduction theorem. It does not explain quite all the difficulties or whatever, all the interest we're going to see with the reduction theorem later on. But this already kind of simulates a little bit of uh, what's going on. For this reason, I suggest to leave it here for today. Uh, you may think about it. You, I mean, the proof is probably half a page. You can, you can prove it as one of the exercises and I'll start uh, in a week from now, from that statement, I'll, I'll show you a very elementary, very short proof. And after that, we start talking about symplectic manifolds. Uh, that's it uh, for today. Maybe you can give me feedback. Was it too fast, too slow, absolutely trivial? How, how, how was it? Or was it incomprehensible? What, what's, the, uh, what's your feeling? It's all very simple. It's all impossible. 
I'm just a little bit confused because there was no examples of symplectic manifolds and some statements about them, so I can't imagine anything like oh, with okay. moment maps and something like this. Oh, 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 sure, sure. But that you will see plenty. Yes, that's that's good. yes, yes. I that's, hope that like they, yeah, they that, will be that's a good point, but of course. Yeah, there will be or plenty. Yeah, there will be many sources of examples, easy examples, more difficult examples. But here I uh, I agree hundred percent. But you know, I just wanted the, you know the purpose of the introduction was more like to to show you what are the what is the type of statements you will have in your toolbox in the end of the course. Right. Okay. And of course, I. I I guess uh, examples of uh, vector spaces. That's probably probably it's fine that I didn't give you many examples of vector spaces. No, no, I am completely not about examples of yeah. vector spaces. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. We, I guess we here we are on the same page. <laughs> okay, look, people, uh, thanks a lot, and uh, then uh, I see you next Monday. So seminar will be in this Zoom conference after. Yeah, 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 right. This will be next. Uh, like the, there will be no tutorial today, right? And then the first tutorial will be next Monday in the same Zoom. And right, Jan, you you have credentials to manage the same Zoom, right? Well, I so the, I did there is today, but I hope I'll be a bit more successful in the future. Mm -hmm. So today there will be no like oh, yeah, right. second part. As we, yeah, as we announced today, there will be no second part. That's that, that's where it stops for today. But uh, you probably now all of you have this uh, first problem set, so you can you can have a look at it. Like um, I think some of those problems are very routine. Some one of them makes kind of. Uh, is is talking to you about something that you've probably seen in, in the other courses like topology of uh, two-dimensional uh, orientable manifolds or two-dimensional surfaces right okay so again thanks a lot if you have further questions about the course or about the material tell me and uh, so otherwise that's it for today thank you thank you bye Bye. Okay, bye. So, and Jan, we can probably stay, stay, and just uh, yeah. Just actually, let's just tell them again before they all leave. I really would like to have contact information. It would be good if they don't forget that. So, I'll just as they are all on their way out, I'll just mention that. Okay. Oh, excuse me, Anton. I have I, I I probably missed the part where I have to ask a question, but I have one question. Can I? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Ask you. So, yeah, there was a part where you have computed the nth power mm -hmm. of omega. Yeah, that's right. Let me. Find yeah, and a. my question is um, yeah, actually, this computation depends on your definition of the exterior uh, product. So, uh, uh, so there are two ways to define uh, exterior product. Yeah, the, the one of them is uh, to take the quotient of the tensor product, mm -hmm. and the another is to embed uh, kind of as anti-symmetric tensor products. And uh, um, wait, wait, wait. I, I, yeah, I understand what you have in mind, but I'm not quite sure whether the calculation depends on it because I guess we, we, we agree that the two forms uh, commute, right? So- Yeah, I, I mean, there, there, uh, there, there should be kind of coefficient, uh, not plus or, or minus one, but something like binomial coefficient of- Oh, but uh, you, you know, the binomial coefficient is n factorial, um, right? So I have- um, Right, I take the nth power, let's say I have x1 plus x2 plus so on plus xn to the power n. Yeah. And I'm now interested in the coefficient in front of the, right, there will be many terms, but there is one term where, which is just the product of all x's, x1 times x2 times so on times xn. 
And what is the binomial coefficient in front of it? It's n factorial, right? So that's my uh, that that's my that's where my binomial coefficient comes. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, uh, so this is binomial coefficient just coming from the number of factors, but right, right. Mm -hmm. No, no. Yeah, but no. maybe this. Maybe I'm asking kind of stupid question, no, but no. there is there is a yes. Yeah, so it, it always uh, confuse me actually. So uh, confuse me just because um, it depends on definition. So if if you take kind of two, I I agree. Let me try to also write something on the. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, you, you're right. I'm also always kind of. Confused, but I think what, uh, what what I'm saying now, right? So, some, something like that. So, uh, so what is f1 wedge f2? And I'm saying that f1 wedge f2 is f1 tensor f2 minus f2 tensor f1, right? I think yeah. that's so, that, yeah. So, that's that's what um, I'm saying now because only only with this uh, uh, only with this definition. F1 wedge F2 of E1 E2 will be plus one and will be minus F1 wedge F2 of E2 E1, right? So uh, otherwise, I uh, so 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 that's that's I think it tells me that that's how I how I define it if I, if I'm not mistaken. But I I, I agree there, there is also always this whatever n factorial question in in the definition how you actually how we actually do it that's right yeah yeah but but i think that's my that that's that's what uh, what i'm doing in my calculation but we will we'll yeah, yeah. we'll have various occasions we're, we're going to work with exterior algebra quite a lot because the the, the two form right it's an element of the exterior algebra uh, fortunately uh, it's a rather low degree so therefore the combinatorics it's uh, usually the question, do you have coefficient one half or not? Yeah, yeah. So this is actually, may, may, I guess this, may, this may, is maybe actually my question. Just one more comment on that. Remember I wrote, I think some, something like this. Yeah. I D X J right here. I explicitly, I explicitly choose to have a normalization one half this is because, right, there the would be here, there would be a term in, in this sum, there would be a term one half omega ij dxi wedge dxj plus one half omega ji dxj dxi. And they actually equal to each other, right? Because omega yeah, one, one, one half here is, is kind of clear for me uh, yeah. okay 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 good so but then so here again dxi wedge dxj dxi tensor dxj minus dxj tensor dxi yeah okay great yeah okay thanks okay. a lot thank you, thank you. Um, excuse me um, maybe could you explain the question that simon asked because i don't really follow that uh i mean no, no matter how we define Mm -hmm. Serial product, the even elements always commute, and uh, we always have the binomial formula. Who, who always commutes? Uh, even well, even even elements. Even, yeah, even whatever. Elements. Yes, right. Yeah, whatever so, you do, that, absolutely. Of course, for this reason, yes, this part of the of the formula is, uh, I think, is, uh, is 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 unconditional. Even elements always commute. Whatever you define. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the previous formula, I think this formula may depend on, on the definition. Oh, I see. I see. If, if in the wedge product, you, you, would, you would say that this is like one half F1 tens F2 minus F2 tens F1, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's, yes. that, that, that's what, uh, uh, what, what we were discussing. Then this formula would give some, some other answer, would, would produce for you one half. But I think the, the the binomial coefficient being n factorial, it's unconditional because uh, yeah, you take an nth power of something and then you do get your n factorial as a binomial coefficient, if I'm not mistaken. So that that I think is always the case. Yeah, basically, thank you. Okay, thank you.
more questions? Uh, can I ask, uh, sure. in this theorem of uh, convexity, yes, uh, yes. is this polytope, uh, is it something interesting or it's just some convex polytope? Does it include I mean, some? That, that, of course, let's say that, that very much depends on the definition of uh, interesting. I mean, many, let's say many people consider those polytopes very interesting, write books about them and build their careers on study of those polytopes. But of course, it, <laughs> it that doesn't, who knows, maybe you find them an interest. Let's say those polytopes, they have a lot of structure. In particular, even like a simple thing, you know, um, th th there is also some internal structure. But even here, let's say, for instance, I take this triangle and the triangle has vertices and it has sides and it has an interior. And you can ask, what's the behavior? What, 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 what does it say about the geometry of the pre-image? Yeah. And about the geometry of the group action on the pre-image? And there is a lot of information which is contained in, this, uh, in those polytops. In fact, um, to be honest, there, there, there is, in, in some cases, there is also a fine structure so that inside the polytop, you can say, like I'm trying to draw now, there, there are some kind of walls inside the polytop and there is what, what is called some kind of wall crossing. When you cross those walls, the, the topology of the fiber changes and the topology of the reduced space changes. So, so there, is, there is a lot of, uh, let's say, talking between combinatorics of those polytops and uh, the geometry and topology of, uh, of what happens with the reduced space. In particular, that was not so obvious, but this theorem three about localization, it's also related to what happens inside the polytop. In, in fact, the first localization theorem, which was proved by Dustermatt and Heckman, it was telling you, like, I, I, I tried to draw those walls, right? But between the walls, there are chambers. For instance, this is a chamber. Inside the chamber, the topology doesn't change. And then you can ask how the symplectic structure of the reduced space changes if you move inside the chamber. And what Dustermatt and Heckman figured out that it changes linearly. So the symplectic structure is linear with respect to kind of this vector space structure uh, from the ambient space, uh, this uh, G star induced on, on, on the chamber. So, so basically this is all in some way connected to each other into some rather rich structure. And uh, I mean, the short answer, yes, I think the, the polytops are very interesting. Uh, as I say, there are many, it, it's uh, maybe the interesting part, it's also talking to many parts of mathematics, to combinatorics and to geometry, to topology. So that's, that may be one exciting feature. Okay, and maybe there is some simplest example which uh, we can do just by hands. Oh uh, yeah, that, that's for sure. Can, yes. can you give one? And yes, I, I will give it. A, yes. I, I will do it as a homework. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So here is here is an example. Right. So this is this is the space R stream, and well, let me call x, y, and z those axes. And so here is a sphere of radius R, let's say S2 R. And uh, here we consider the area form, let's say omega. And uh, as an S1 action, So we consider the rotation action rotation around Z axis. Um, 
then I think a little bit depending on, on your normalizations, it will turn out that, that this S1 acting on the two sphere with omega area form and the moment map uh, to be up to up to some factor. I, I'm not sure. This this will depend on which normalizations you choose. This will be just the z coordinate. Uh, will be the moment map. Right. Is a Hamiltonian S1 space. So uh, in principle, in, in this case, you can uh, you can check you can check everything. I think all the even if you if you want all the three theorems, you can simply check. And of course, we'll do it during the course at some point. This will be always the easiest example. But that example you can do as a homework even now. That's uh, that's all quite elementary. Maybe. Uh, just uh, just one hint, or do you want a hint? No, but <laughs> okay, fine, good, 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 good attitude. <laughs> all right. So, but as I say, all all you 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 can just simply check all three theorems and see what kind of. Of course, in this case, the, the, this will not be extraordinary results, but it should all work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. I'm sorry, but uh, isn't the action of a kind of coordinate torus on cn easier than this one so well, sorry so kind of you're suggesting some other example right yeah i suggest example of uh, action of tk on ck just by multiplying coordinates uh okay this is um that this, this is a good point you can take it as an exercise and show that it doesn't work <laughs> right that's, that's, but that's, that's i mean important. i mean uh, it, it, yeah, it maybe, works let, let, but, me, but... Let, me, let me state it more precisely so suppose because we still want the thing to be symplectic right suppose we have t2 right t2 is um, is symplectic and let's say we, 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 we i call those angle coordinates theta and phi you can say that they take values from zero to two pi or from zero to one, whatever, whatever you want, right? And uh, you take the, the two form, d theta of h d phi. Certainly it is symplectic, right? No doubt about it. And then we are, we are trying to do the following, right? We, we are saying that we have uh, T2, I'm sorry, but this is this is not my example, actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tell me then. What, what is your example? My example is if you take c n c to the power n and oh. uh, omega to be d z uh, d z i. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, right. d z i bar. Yeah. So so that 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 will be one of our examples next time. But never mind. So. Right, so that's okay. Okay, fine. So this is this is our example, right? And we consider the torus action. We we consider T n, right? There should be maybe D uh, D Z uh, I instead of D Z M. Yeah, in the right. formula. That's right. So and then we we have an action of the torus, which which is like this, right? Yes, yes. Sure, yeah, that's also that's also a very good example. And especially that's good that this is an action on a vector space. Certainly this will be one of our, one of our basic examples, especially that's, yeah, that, that's good for everything, for convexity, for localization, for reduction. Yes, that's certainly- Yeah, that, but the, the only problem that here we have non-compact manifold, but uh, yes. in case of non-compact manifold, we have, uh, uh, well, there there won't be um, uh, a polytop in in the sense of uh, it is not compact, but um, yeah, but, but 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 you know those results they are sometimes negotiable. So here it will be polyhedral cone instead of yeah, the yeah. polytop, but it's still going to be convex, but not bounded. 
Yeah, you're right, of course. Okay, uh, more questions or suggestions? Thanks a lot for your comments. But I mean, the example of a sphere is also a good example. So there you get a polytop in dimension one. Right. All right. So I have a question on the definition of, of, of a Hamiltonian G space. Yeah. So good. we have the moment map, and do we require it to be anything like uh, immersion or submersion? Or is it just a smooth map such that mm, I mean, no, the covariance and so on? No, no, I don't know. No, no. I mean, of course, uh, there might be there might be situations when it is. Uh, uh, but these are very special situations when it is uh, immersion or submersion, but normally not really. No, I mean, okay, so the, you say uh, normally they won't be. I know no, normally they, they, they won't mm -hmm. be. You, no, you can you can actually check in those examples that we already mentioned in our previous discussion. No, no normally, so the there would be uh, right. So so, no, it just you you can uh, you you can think. Suppose that G is S one, right? Then the moment map is uh, one function, right? And this function mm -hmm. would usually have critical points it would also have regular points so i wouldn't say that it is completely generic that that, that we'll see it, it has some special properties but in, in a more in, in in a more subtle way so yeah you, I, I yeah I would, I would say no usually it doesn't have say so because those properties you mentioned are very strong mm -hmm. it, no it's, it's it would be too restrictive Okay. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Look, thanks. Thanks for questions. Any more worries? Any more ideas? Yeah, I have another question. So, our second class will be uh, here as well. Yeah, yeah, that's the same Zoom session all the time. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, people, thanks a lot. And yeah, see you next week. Okay, so it's just me. Yeah, so we, Ian, we stay, right? We, we, we can stay in the same. I'm just, uh, God, I'm so incredibly primitive. I've just got this, I've only got my, it's got dark here while I think I'll just turn the lights. Yeah, I, actually, I think these people haven't understood that it's finished. <laughs> there, are about, yeah. there are about seven other people. But we can, yeah, if you want, I can send you another Zoom link. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, look, people, thanks. Bye bye. Okay, bye. Bye, thank you. Yeah, I'll, be, I'll be now closing the session. <laughs>